Hello, Forecaster here, and I thought we would take a look at the Railcraft electric tracks and locomotives and the associated equipment. So, first, let's have a look at the electric meter. It is crafted like this, pretty cheap, and if you right click a component with it that uses Railcraft Charge, you can see it shows you the uh, current charge level, which is the power stored, the draw per tick current, and the loss, which is static, and varies a little between the uh, devices. As you can see, the uh, electric feeder unit here has a loss of one charge per tick, so that is one charge uh, lost uh, when power is transferred from this block to another, I think, um, per tick. Uh, the electric feeder unit is used to convert energy units from industrial craft into charge, and uh, next we have the electric shunting wire. It has a loss of 0.25 charge per tick. It is crafted in the rolling machine with four lead, four pieces of paper, and a block of copper. You get eight of them. And shunting wire can be used to connect components together. That's pretty much its entire purpose. Uh, flux transformer is crafted like this. You get two, so you need four of these recipes, so four times these components, uh, because you need eight of these blocks to make a working flux transformer. And it accepts RF, such as from steam engines, and converts it into charge. It has a loss of 0.25 charge per tick. Next we have the force track emitter, which has a loss of zero charge per tick. And it is crafted like this with a diamond block, four copper, and four tin plates. Uh, and we will look at this later. Next we have the admin feeder unit and the admin steam producer and both of these produce infinite steam and uh, charge respectively uh, when powered by a redstone signal and when off they do nothing and obviously they don't have recipes they are meant for creative uh, we also have the wire support frame which is crafted like this and uh, wire support frames are meant for connecting, uh, uh, for allowing wires to connect to tracks. Um, a wire will not connect to the side of a track, while a full block, and if the components that are full blocks, will uh, transfer power to a track that is next to them. Um, a shunting wire, however, will only connect to the underside of a track. But you can't place track directly on the uh, wire. You need to place the track on a support frame, and you can then put wire inside the support frames. And as you can see, when there is a track that can accept charge on top, there is a symbol and also a connection rendered however on the regular track that is not charged um, there is no connection and no symbol so now the power will be able to flow from this side through the wire to this side and this could be a locking track or something similar so as you can see you can put wire into uh, support frames uh, you can also 
place support frames over placed wire and wire can of course connect to outside of the frames as well if needed um, now power transfer between components uh, all components are considered um, a power storage and when two components are adjacent to each other and properly connected uh, they will try to balance their respective storages so each component can store roughly 10,000 charge um, so if we have a component uh, could probably demonstrate this with the force track emitter actually um, I will be right back alright so here we have a force track emitter and as we saw earlier it has a loss of zero so if I put a an admin feeder unit next to it it will fully charge the uh, force emitter and if I then take another and place it next to this one now both of these have 5000 uh, charge so uh, they balanced the the charge between them so this had 10,000 and this had nothing so this force emitter gave this uh, emitter 5,000 charge uh, so they both are uh, equal so they both have an equal amount and because there's no loss between them um, we got exactly 5,000 5, and there's no constant loss if we put another one here we now have uh, three, 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 three. Yeah, and if we put another one down. We'll have two thousand five hundred charge in each of these. So we still have ten thousand charge because of the lack of loss, um, but it's split equally between these four components and all of the components work the same way however um, all other components except the force track emitter and the admin feeder unit have uh, a loss associated with them so either when they receive or send energy uh, some of it is lost which means if they since they are sending power back and forth between each other constantly um, there's a little energy lost each time so as we can see in this setup here we have a uh, an information panel which is connected to this average counter from uh, both of these are from uh, nuclear control for industrial craft 2 and the average counter is taking power from this uh, MFE here and it's passing through and sending it to this electric feeder unit and when the energy is passing through this is counting and it is calculating the average for each second which we can see here and it's showing it as per tick so we have a constant drain of about 26 EU per tick and all that's connected to this feeder unit are these tracks that go up in a loop up there and over this track it goes and comes back and all of these are draining 26 energy units per tick which is not a whole lot um, well I suppose that depends what you have for power generation but it's not that much generally speaking 
Um, and if we check here, you can see that the power is fluctuating. It goes up and it goes down a little and up again. And it keeps doing that because these tracks are trying to ba all balance each other. This track is trying to balance with these two, while these two are trying to balance with these two, and so on. So the power levels are constantly changing, and the tracks are sending energy back and forth between each other, trying to balance. And each time they do that, there is a little loss. Um, so, um, you have to account for that when you are using these. Um, now, when you're, if you have a long line of tracks, uh, so this this track goes a fair bit away and then doubles back, uh, but I have a regular track here, so the power cannot cross this gap here. It has to go all the way around and come here. Now, if uh, we have pretty much full charge here. Um, the lower. If I put a track here, you can see this charges pretty quickly because all of these tracks are helping powering this one and these are pretty much full so this charges pretty quickly. However, when, the, when you are laying these tracks down um, you will be placing a lot of empty tracks pretty quickly probably and if you have a power source connected the power will have to flow through each of these tracks and they will fill up quite slowly to begin with. But once they have filled up, they will um, maintain their charge pretty well as long as there is constant power flowing in. Now the problem comes with chunk loading. Um, and you probably know how chunks work. So in this setup here, let's pretend each block is a chunk. Uh, currently, a chunk loader and a or a an anchor or an anchor cart will load a three by three uh, area around it. So, if the chunk loader is in this chunk, uh, this blue area here will be loaded. Um, so, we have an anchor here. Now let's pretend this is our base here and we have an anchor inside it that is keeping this area loaded. Then we have a an electric track that goes through here and it goes through uh, these nine chunks. Now this area is loaded so these tracks will be powered by our base and power will be flowing here. But this chunk is not loaded. So these tracks, or the track at the very beginning here, can't receive any power. So these tracks, um, if we assume when we were laying these uh, this railway that we had no power connected in our base. So none of the tracks were receiving any charge while we were laying them. Uh, we then went back to our base. Now, since we're a player, we would load a bigger area, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, so at our base, we connected the power to the tracks, which sent power to these tracks, but this cannot receive power because it's unloaded. Um, we then send a train here with an anchor cart down this line. Now, a, an electric locomotive has a small buffer, um, which will last a few seconds. Um, now, the, the train will be coming down this way, and it has an anchor cart. So when it comes into this chunk here, it will be keeping these chunks here loaded. So load these three chunks. Now when, the, when that happens, this chunk here, or this track here, 
will start receiving power from these tracks here. Right? And the train will be able to keep pulling power from the train uh, or the tracks. Now, depending on how quickly uh, the train moves, when the train enters this chunk here, it will be keep loading. It will load these chunks here, and all as well. Now, power will be able to flow through these two chunks from the base, and then when the train gets here it will be loading this red area while the base loader is keeping this area loaded however once the train comes into this chunk it will load these three blue chunks here and it will stop loading these three red chunks here and it will keeping this area loaded now this cuts off uh, the track where the train is from our base. Power will no longer be able to flow through these unloaded chunks here. So we now have a limited um, supply of power which will... Uh, the power that has filled these tracks uh, here and probably started trickled in here uh, will try to balance across these chunks uh, the tracks in these chunks uh, and then when we uh, move another chunk away we will unload these and we will lose access to the power that's in these tracks ac across here um, which will be about a third if you uh, if we have three chunks loaded at a time and they're all evenly balanced we will lose a third of the power assuming that the new chunks th the, the new chunk that gets loaded is empty because it has no power yet so um, there are a couple of ways to avoid this problem now you could have your train move at the slowest speed through the chunks and allow power to fill up uh, each of the uh, chunks. You could bring, when laying down the track, of course you, you could connect power directly from your base from the start and allow the tracks to fill up as you lay them, but you will have the same problem that when you get far enough away and you have nothing loading the chunks in between to your base, the power supply will be cut off. You could also bring a power source with you and um, lay a section of tracks, then connect power to it and let the tracks charge up to uh, full power or as close as they can get, then remove the power source and move on. Now of course the tracks will not be consuming any power no power will be lost when the chunks are loaded because there's no power flow that will cause a loss um, another thing you could do and I have no idea how many actually know you can do this um, there is these so this is an anchor sentinel uh, it is fairly cheap and you can p place it in the world like this and the anchor sentinel doesn't do anything on its own if we turn on any ice at chunk boundaries um, you can see we're in this chunk here now if I put the sentinel somewhere in the same chunk it'd be on top of the anchor or uh, somewhere else just as, it, as long as it's in the same chunk I then right-click the anchor with a crowbar and we can pair it with a world anchor and this world anchor um, now operates differently instead of loading a 3x3 
a chunk area like it used to, it will now load uh, anything that's in a straight line to this sentinel. And because the sentinel is in the same chunk that the anchor is in, it will only load this chunk. Now it will still consume the same amount of fuel if it's configured to use fuel, since you can disable this in the config files if you want, um, as if it were loading nine chunks. Um, now you can take the sentinel and put it in an adjacent chunk and we'll do the same thing so the anchor will now load this chunk that the anchor is in and this chunk that the sentinel is in then we can take the sentinel and put it over here and link them back up and similarly the anchor will now load this chunk that the anchor is in. It will load this chunk over here that the sentinel is in. It will also load this chunk that is in between. And so on. We can put the sentinel over here. And when we pair it with the anchor, it will load all of these chunks that are in between the anchor and the sentinel. Now the anchor could still only load nine chunks in total. So we have one, two, three, four, and five. Then we could load six, seven, eight, and nine more. Well, not nine more, but you know what I mean. Um, so if we put the sentinel here in this chunk and paired it with the anchor, the anchor would be able to keep all the chunks down this line to the anchor loaded. If we put the sentinel, however, in this chunk and paired it with the anchor, the, the anchor would still only be able to keep uh, the chunks up to here loaded. It will not load this chunk. I do think it still works, or there may be a warning that they that it is out of range. Let's check. Don't use these very often. Uh, no, it's still yeah. So it's, I I believe that the anchor will keep as many chunks as it can load it. So load the chunks all the way up here, but I will not be able to load this chunk here. So um, you can use this to put uh, to keep the chunks where your tracks are loaded without having to load the chunks around, and you need fewer uh, anchors to do it. Uh, the drawback of this, obviously, is that when the tracks are always loaded, they will keep uh, sending power back and forth, and they will um, there will then be a power drain uh, constantly from the tracks. So um, let's look at the uh, force track emitter now. So the force track emitter uh, you might already have seen, you may not. What it does is um, if we give it power by connecting it to this admin feeder unit, let's turn off the chunk boundaries and we power it and then we give it a redstone signal, it will emit a force track. Big surprise. And it will emit the force track from one block above the emitter and one block in front of. And the front is where this slightly uh, 
larger square is and it will face you when you place it and you can also use a crowbar to rotate it when it is turned off not when it is on and the uh, track will continue until it hits a block or until it reaches it, its uh, maximum range which I don't remember um, and carts can move across this track like it's a suspended track but players and other entities can't interact with it at all um, now an interesting feature that this has is if we put a track like this and then take something to use as a uh, let's see, stop. We want a wire support frame. Uh, now it ran out of power. We take a steam locomotive, turn it around, and then we'll put some water and a fire stone in it and let it heat up. Now, this locking track is obviously unpowered. Um, but if we um, bring power to the bridge again, and we can do this like... Actually, let's use wire. Now, when this charges up again, when the power has flown through the wire, See, when the bridge has formed completely, um, the emitter automatically powered the locking track. So if we send this back, some visual glitches there. If we turn off the redstone signal again, whoops, and send the locomotive back uh, it will not be allowed to continue because there is no bridge so the force track emitter can be used to control uh, locking tracks to make sure your trains don't crash into whatever uh, chasm the uh, emitter is supposed to be bridging uh, if it should run out of power or uh, be otherwise turned off for some reason. So, um, now another interesting thing we can notice is if we check this track here, it has power. Now, the emitter is being powered by this wire here and because this track is next to the uh, emitter the emitter is sending power to this track here now if, if I had put the tracks like this um, the emitter would not be allowed, uh, able to send power to this track here that's receiving power from these tracks here because it's not adjacent to it. So, um, if you put your tracks like this, you will have to power the emitter either through wire, maybe like that. Uh, but if you put your tracks like this, you will automatically power the emitter via the track which means one less step, which means a tiny bit of power saved in losses, which actually do add up over time. Now, a thing you cannot do with this uh, locking track feature is if I put a emitter here, and you can see the bigger square is facing me, I cannot put a locking track here and 
if I extend this a little bit, get rid of these plants. If I were to send a cart of some description across this bridge, this will be it will be released by this locking crack. You might want to have it push the cart, uh, have it in a mode that pushes the cart like uh, that. But when it comes to this side, it will be caught by this locking track. And this emitter will not power this locking track because as far as it knows, there is no bridge here. So it will these will only power the locking track when they have deployed a bridge uh, fully. So if we do this, I put this here and power this, then turn this on. Once this emitter has deployed its bridge, it will release the cart. But now this is not deploying a bridge, so it will catch the cart. So um, you would either have to have something that when a train comes this way, it turns off that side and turns on this side, or simply powers this track automatically. Um, but then there might not be a bridge. You could have something that detects if there is a force track on this side and not have an emitter here. Or you could have two lanes, one going that direction with an emitter on this side, and then have a lane on this side with its own emitter, and probably a bunch of other ways to solve it. So I believe that's everything, and I hope it's been useful. So I will see you in the next video.